through God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. There's a certain in-between bitter sweetness about the first Sunday after Christmas. As I've said, we are still technically in the Christmas season, but it feels like after going all out on the 24th and the 25th and multiple services over the course of the last week, we just don't have the energy to fully celebrate today the way we probably should. Not to mention we have to also be ready to celebrate New Year's later on this week to the extent that we're able. And honestly, that feels like a much more major holiday to us. It's right there on our calendars, New Year's Day. You don't really see first Sunday after Christmas on your calendar unless you're a church worker. So that tends to steal our attention and focus. And so today becomes this limbo of a Sunday in between major events where we come to church, although not quite as many as we're here on Thursday night, because we know we should but it can be more difficult to really be present in the here and now as we're either remembering the great gifts we got on Friday or we're trying to figure out what a New Year's party is going to look like this Thursday. <laughs> so it's fitting that our Gospel reading for today is equally bittersweet. It's full of rejoicing and praise and thanksgiving and a great canticle of the Church is brought out of it, reminding us why the Christ child has come. But everything in the Gospel reading today is also tinged by the shadow of death. And I'm not trying to be a Grinch and steal away your Christmas joy or anything, but like I said at the beginning of our Advent journey, we need to know the destination to properly prepare for the trip. And while Jesus did become incarnate in order to reveal the Father's will to us and to, to declare the coming of the Kingdom of Heaven and to preach the message of the Gospel hope to everyone, he ultimately does come to die for us on the cross. And that core of gospel hope is found in Christ crucified and resurrected. And so it makes sense that the very next reading after Christmas Day would be pointing to his role as the one who will die for us. Our reading from Luke today opens with the purification rituals for Jesus and Mary at the temple. Mary has to be purified according to the Mosaic Law to restore her to full ceremonial cleanliness after giving birth. It's basically the Jewish version of welcoming a woman back after her maternity leave, so now she's fully back into regular society. She can attend temple services and so on. But this tells us that his parents are righteous Jews who are fulfilling all of the observances in the law. But it's also worth noting that verse 24 tells us that they sacrifice two turtle doves, which is a concession allowed for poor families who can't afford a lamb, which reminds us again of the actual humble estate of the holy family that Jesus is born into. For Jesus, however, he is also being brought to the temple for purification and presentation. Luke's parenthetical note lets us know that it's part of the law saying that every firstborn male shall be called holy to the Lord. But if we go back to when this is established in the Torah, we see it's actually a reminder for all of Israel of the Passover and their exodus from slavery. See, as we all know, part of the tenth plague is that God claimed the lives of all of the firstborn males who were in Egypt but he passed over the houses of the Israelites who put the Passover lamb's blood on their doorway. But he still claimed all of the firstborn of Israel in perpetuity. And so the law says that every firstborn child, the one who opens the womb, is to be redeemed by the sacrifice of a lamb, or two turtle doves if you're especially poor, so that the people will always remember the steadfast love that God showed them in delivering them out of Egypt. And so it's not that Jesus was sinful and needed to be purified the way everyone else did, but he is fully keeping the law as the firstborn. But ironically, Jesus is the one who's going to die to redeem all of the people the next time he comes, or when he comes into Jerusalem as an adult. But here he's being brought into Jerusalem as a babe to be redeemed and presented to his father. But that Passover connection reminds us that the sacrificial death that looms over him for his entire life is already here in his birth narrative. And while they're at the temple, 
we enter into the central figure of today's reading, Simeon. We don't know much about Simeon beyond what Luke tells us, that he was righteous and devout, full of the Holy Spirit, and awaiting the consolation of Israel, because at some point, in some way, the Holy Spirit revealed to him that he would not see death until he saw the Lord's Christ. Now, he's traditionally pictured as an elderly person. Some traditions even say he was the last surviving translator of the Septuagint, which would put him around 150-ish, so very old, if that is the case. And I know, personally, this may just because I'm, be because I'm a fan of the Highlander franchise and other movies of those genre, but I picture him in my mind as somebody with a supernaturally extended lifespan waiting to see this fulfillment occur. But it's also entirely possible he was a young man. We don't know for sure his age isn't given like Anna's is. Nevertheless, the Holy Spirit has instructed him to come to the temple today because God's word to him is now going to be fulfilled. And Mary hands over Jesus to him, and Simeon gets to hold God's promise incarnate in his arms. The long wait is over. He witnesses the consolation of Israel in his very hands. And he blesses God, and he utters the Nunc Dimittis, the Song of Simeon, which has since made its way into our liturgy as a canticle to be sung after receiving communion. Lord, now let your servant depart in peace. For I have finally seen the salvation that you have promised for all people. Gentiles and Israel shall be redeemed through this child. Amen. And then Simeon gives another prophecy about how this salvation will be accomplished. Jesus is going to cause the rise and fall of many. He will cause the fall of those who stumble over his messages of righteousness through faith, of a restored relationship between man and God without having to do temple sacrifices, of salvation by the perfect sacrifice of the Son of God. Those who believe these teachings will truly rise and be redeemed as children of God. He's going to be opposed by those in power, but his word will be a sword piercing through the soul of humanity, revealing the hearts of many, showing those who love their Lord, their God, and those who only love the earthly wealth and power they can try to make off of his name. Again, this is a song of praise and thanksgiving. That's why we sing it after receiving communion, but it's also tinged with death lurking in the background. Not only the prophesied death of Jesus on the cross by which these things are accomplished, but Simeon's seemingly impending demise. Because given Luke's preface that Simeon was promised he would not see death before he saw the Christ, we naturally read the opening sentence, depart in peace, as a euphemism for Simeon's passing. And like I said, we traditionally think of him as an older man, so it's easy to picture him as an almost decrepit old man, shambling about with little else to live for, a tired man who possibly has lived for a much longer than average lifespan and has now spent years, if not decades, crying out, How long, O Lord? A man that we see as one waiting for death as a relief from the weariness of life. And so often we read this account of Simeon finally finding himself freed of a burden of life as death he has been waiting for can now finally come and allow him to rest in peace. Perhaps that's the way many of you have been feeling in the aftermath of the Christmas highs as we now have to return to the everyday life of work, bills, social media, election disputes, COVID numbers, and all the other things that make our lives weary. The things we got to forget about last Thursday, but now come about on Monday. Simeon has seen the promised salvation. His faith in God has been justified. The final arrangements are in place, and now he gets to depart in peace from the aches and pains of his life, and he doesn't have to deal with the nonsense anymore. I think we've all felt that to some degree at some point in the last year, maybe not quite waiting to die like we're picturing Simeon in the descriptive language I've been giving you, but you certainly have that feeling of just being done with 2020 and wanting to put everything aside and just escape from everything for a little bit, not have to think about anything so we can rest. But that interpretation of Simeon, I think, is reading a little bit too much modernist despair into the text. 
we really should try to reevaluate Simeon's perspective a little bit if we really want to understand the messages at play here. A closer reading of the text doesn't find Simeon emptying himself of burdens, letting go of things in life that are weighing him down. In fact, if anything, he's filling his arms with salvation and that is found in Jesus. He's adding new burdens as it's now becoming his job to tell everyone else that the Messiah has come, just as Anna is about to do in the next couple of verses. And so with that in mind, his song of praise to God, in which he declares that he is now free to depart in peace, is not him acting like some tragic vampire in one of those romance movies who just longs to be set free from this life. He's not waiting to die. He's not necessarily looking forward to death. But he's acknowledging that he has no reason to fear it. He has declared that with his own eyes, he has seen God's salvation. God's promise to him has been fulfilled, and now he is reassured that all of God's other promises will be. And so while death isn't something Simeon should hope for, he doesn't have to dread it either. Whenever his last day happens to be, he is now ready to die well, as 15th century theologians call it. He recognizes that for him, death is now a journey from his life of serving God to being welcomed into the arms of his Savior. Or as Paul would phrase it in Philippians, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet my desire is to depart and be with Christ. But I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus. This is why we place the song of Simeon immediately after communion in our liturgy. We'll sing it as the closing hymn today because it's a non-communion Sunday, so sorry for bad planning on my part, but try to remember this for next week and we'll sing, at the, sing it at the appropriate time there. But when we do partake in communion, we physically hold the real presence of Christ's body and blood in our hands, just as Simeon did. We see and experience our salvation in Christ being given for us, redeeming us from our sins and making us God's own, just as Jesus was dedicated to God the Father in the temple at the start of today's reading. And then, after we've received that blessing, after we've been secured in our faith and our salvation, we too can be prepared to die well whenever that day comes, so we will no longer have to fear it, but see it as simply walking into the arms of our Savior. And so as we navigate our way through this intermediary Sunday and into the week to come, making our plans for New Year's, whatever that hold on to, and try to find the joy of Christmas and hold on to that amidst the mess of 2020, let us remember that beyond the triteness of saying Jesus is the reason for the season, but that his actual reason is to die in our place, to be our Passover lamb who takes away the sin of the world, to redeem all of us in the eyes of our Father, just as the Israelites were in the Exodus. And recognizing that salvation that he offers you through word and sacrament and the forgiveness of your sins, you too can be prepared to depart in peace whenever that time should come that the Lord calls you home. And personally, I hope you stick around for a while because I like you guys. <laughs> But until that day comes, may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, the light of revelation for all the Gentiles, until the life everlasting. Merry Christmas.